So hello, uh, welcome to um, AirHacks Interactive Ex uh, AirHacks uh, Question and Answers, um, the first Monday of the month. And I got um, too many questions actually, so I couldn't pick any questions from my blog. So I start with a really good question from uh, Roman Ettemann. I got the question via Twitter. And the question is, the, the first question is the, um, deploying jars with embedded containers. So what the story in uh, Java E doesn't make sense or not, this is actually the question. And um, I mean, it was always possible to uh, deploy uh, Java E applications uh, as jars. Um, actually, it, uh, it is a typical EGB jar, it's a jar, but um, you can even create a very simple one. So um, I will just create one and call this um, Maven project. I will use my own archetype, com air hex. I will use the version one two. Uh, just a jar. So it will create a war project. So it will take a, a second because it fetches um, this artifact from Maven Central. And uh, the packaging is war. I could just use a jar packaging. You see, it changes the icon, but it's just, just a jar. I could use exactly this. And then, let's see, I could use, um, for instance, something like um, job scheduler and um, package com air hex. And this could be a regular EGB. It has to be something active. You cannot just um, deploy POJOST or, or JPA objects or JPA entities. It has to be something which starts with the server. So I will even use a startup singleton for this. And uh, method uh, schedule. <laughs> no idea how to call this schedule annotation. And this should fire every a uh, couple of seconds. So hour and uh, seconds, let's say every two seconds, every two seconds and all minutes. So, and this uh, should work. Plus new data. So if you would like to use uh, dependency injection, what's uh, Okay, sure. Um, if you would like to use dependency injection, you will have to create a bin.xml file. This is the deal. So without bin.xml, it would not work. So um, this should be deployable. So if I will just build this, um, you see, I got just a jar folder. And um, yeah, if I put it to the um, uh, folder of an application server, it uh, should work. So I would just uh, could start the application server. I could use um, this time the uh, Whitefly 8 because I used um, all the time the Glassfish or Lambda Glassfish and now I can use the Whitefly application server. And uh, it is an actually an excellent application uh, plugin for NetBeans. This is an external plugin uh, built by someone uh, with Twitter handle Ech Savoye. This is his Twitter handle, but it feels really like a Glassfish. So I get uh, the same the same uh, integration as Glassfish. So I could even use uh, both interchangeably. And um, yeah, now uh, the JBoss is fired. So I will just use my iTerm and go to work servers widefly. I use the final one, uh, standalone deployments. And um, I will just open the folder and then go to junk, <laughs> just a jar, target, and um, open this. And I will put it here. And um, with a little bit of luck, it's deploying, deployed. You see that it actually works. So what I did right now, I deployed a plain jar. So it's really a jar, it's not an EJB jar, it's just a plain jar. This is actually nothing there, just a POJO. So I mean, 
uh, I hope the question is answered. So it was always possible. Um, or it is um, since Java 6, it is possible. And in Java 5 and prior, you had to use an EJB jar to achieve the same. And if you look to the, um, into the EJB jar, there's actually nothing there, just one class. No XML, no properties files, nothing. So um, why I didn't use the um, deployment from, from NetBeans? Because it's just a regular jar, and NetBeans didn't know that I actually could deploy it even to JBoss. It would, it would search for a main method. And uh, why I always start with uh, a war, because I'm assuming that we will need um, something like JAXORS, and actually I use JAXORS all the time for stuff like uh, monitoring or uh, yeah, simple monitoring even. So I hope the question is answered live, and um, yeah, just as I will have to, would like to get rid of this annoying output here. So I would like to undeploy this. Uh, I'm curious where it is. Huh. It was listed as EJB module, what is not quite right, but it's the closest. So so now it's undeployed. I hope the question is answered. Um, let's see. Uh, any questions regarding this? Yeah, hex. No, then I hope you are happy with the answer. So um, it is as lean as you can get. Just one jar with one class and it works. Okay, then pick the next one. How to structure uh, the UI? And this is actually a quite a nice uh, question. So I got here someone from PHP. Actually, it's funny. I got lots of PHP developers who, who are interested in Java E. Um, I see the trend for, for several uh, years or, already. So, um, yeah, it seems like um, uh, PHP devs really like Java E, which is a good thing. And um, what I usually do, I structure my backend uh, according to the um, entity control boundary or boundary control entity pattern, which is rather simple. So you have one boundary, which is the... Um, the, uh, the boundary to the outside world, then you get a control, and the control is something reusable, and the entity, so which is the persistence. And this is actually quite quite simple. And um, the PHP developer asked me, okay, how to approach or, okay, the business is simple, but what to do in the front end? And um, actually, I cannot question, answer the question in one hour. So um, actually, we, we spend a whole day during the regular uh, air hacks workshops just uh, talking about this and this is i think one of the most controversial days java e web frameworks and H uh, java e and html5 but um what what you would like what you will have to do is you will have to think about um what for what is actually the, the user of the application it's the basic question and if uh, the user is the internet so all possible users usually you would end up having JAX arrest RESTful web services, which are going to be consumed by uh, application like most likely AngularJS or EmberJS or stuff like this, XJS or some kind of HTML5 framework. So actually, uh, Java e ends then. But if this is a simple enterprise application, you could use JSF, Java Server, um, Java Server Faces, for instance, and comes out of the box. Extremely simple. I use it all the time for simple administrative uh, tasks. And the question is how to structure such an application. So uh, do, do we have something like a boundary control entity or, or, or something similar? So um, how to approach this? And um, unf 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 un unfortunately, it is not as easy as the backend. So and, um, it is really hard to have a component which spans presentation and business tier. So actually, um, it is unlikely that you will be able to do this because usually you have some reusable UI components in the front end, reusable services in the back end. There is no exact one to one matching. It is more likely that you will get end to end matching. So, um, what I usually do, I try to find some kind of concepts or abstractions in the front end. So, what I mean by that, usually if I have no idea what I'm doing, I would uh, create one folder per view for instance. So you have one page, one folder, and this is the view. Of course, in single page applications, a little bit harder because you will end up with one folder per application. But in enterprise applications, usually you get more views or more, uh, more subsystems. So something like this. So I would, exactly as in the backend, 
look at the UI and try to abstract things and then structure the UI, UI according to the business requirements and not uh, uh, according to technology. So I would not create one folder for managed beans, the other folder for, I don't know, UI components. I would rather structure after the concepts. Um, and um, so about the framework, so the, the basic question is, uh, do we need a client-server framework or, uh, or, or um, client-centric or server-centric framework? But um, no one asked the question. So if you if you like to discuss this, just ask me the next time about client and server centric frameworks, and I will cover and dedicate a question at the beginning of June. I, I hope this is covered. Um, it is. I cannot answer it right with, with a piece of code because you know there are about there are more UI technology than than backend technologies. So I hope the question is answered as well. Um, so we have no uh, hex. Ah, uh, Roman Ettemann asked me uh, bootstrapping the uh, servers from the jar. Actually, I thought about this um, for, my, for my pink application. So um, I wrote a very simple application which, um, which just uh, is, is pingable. So you can actually see whether the, the application is working or not. And I will provide some extensions um, is on GitHub, on my GitHub account. And actually, I thought about this. Uh, um, this is the pink, where is it? Here. Um, here, because it makes absolutely sense to bundle the application server with the war. And uh, it is already a reality, uh, Roman, because uh, if you look at um, Jenkins, if you download Jenkins, you can just um, install Jenkins by doing something like java minus char jenkins.war and it will start from within the war. So if you're building a product, you can absolutely do it. And you should even do it because um, if the um, installation is um, it, it, it makes the installation m more easier and uh, and so your product uh, uh, more appealing to the customers I hope now is the question answered hopefully okay um, and thank you to the Java e platform which you should of course follow they uh, announced uh, this event which is really nice so thank you Java e platform um, I'm really curious whether Java e platform is a um, Oracle handle or uh, individual? So if, if possible, just answer this. It would be nice to know. So, okay. So we have um, we, we have two questions basically covered already. I hope we are in time. Oh, problem with lambdas, um, app servers, and possible solutions. So I got a question like, um, so this is actually how it looks like uh, prior um, with the regular Glassfish 4, if you would like, to deploy a um, application with Lambda. And the question is why it happens? And someone asked me, um, cool, any idea how to get support for 4.0, anything that I can update or patch myself? So it's a broader question. Uh, so how to fix the problem? If you have an application server, an old application server, you would like to have, um, uh, you would like to have Lambdas running on this. And what's the deal with Lambdas? And um, usually Java e does not care about lambdas, but the application service uh, somehow do. So why? And uh, the answer is pretty simple. Uh, Lambda uses invoke dynamic. And application servers, what they do, they have to manipulate the bytecode in order to create proxies. So, um, and they use frameworks. And uh, some frameworks like uh, this is ASM, the older version of ASM, if they see a byte code which they do not know, they throw exception, like in this case. So what happens behind the scenes here? The ASM framework um, look <laughs> so the very first time invoke dynamic bytecode extension and throw the exception. So um, how to fix this? If you um, if you are running an older Glassfish, you should try to um, to fix the problem by upgrading the ASM library, for instance or a framework inside the application server which is responsible um, of the bytecode generation. This would be the approach. So try to find in your application server the subsystem which is responsible for the proxy generation and attempt try to upgrade this. This would be actually my approach. Hope it is answered. Okay got another uh, interactive question. How do you manage auth sessions in a REST app consumed by an 
consumed by an HTML framework like AngularJS. So the question is how to deal with uh, authentication and authorization. So actually, you could use whatever framework you like. You could use uh, OAuth, for instance. Um, and um, how I use it, it really depends on my customers how to use it. But we have one question, um, uh, question according to authentication and authorization. If you have the source codes, I will show you what you can do out of the box with Java E. But um, if you if your question is targets the um, the uh, session, you could even have stateful uh, JAXRS uh, services. It's, uh, it's not a big deal. Um, I even wrote a blog post about this. I think Adam Bean HTTP uh, state. Oh, this is actually nice. Um, not HTTP state. Uh, let's let's see. Hessian. I think this was called um, Cookie Manager. Let's see. Yes, this is the blog post. And in this blog post, if it was this single line of code, um, what happens behind the scenes, the cookie manager will send uh, cookies back and forth and make whatever you have. In this, uh, in this example, I used uh, Hessian, but it could be JAXRS. Um, it will send the cookies back and forth and make effectively your JAXRS service uh, state full, if this is the question. And how to do this particular, uh, really, uh, all API APIs, um, web APIs do it differently. If you just look on public APIs, usually they use some kind of um, API token, which is sent back and forth. Uh, then your API can be even stateless. So um, perfect. Um, the next one. So um, I have. I hope we covered this. Archelion versus Mokito, and this is a very common one. Actually, I got um, several, um, several, um, I just drink a coffee. We got, um, I got se several requests for even whole day workshops about um, Archelion, um, about testing and quality. In fact, the question is so common that I decided to create a dedicated day, special event, Java 7 testing and deployment and code quality in July about this, and this is already, uh, we have already sufficient registrations that will take place. So, um, and the, the question boils down is how to, how to test Java E applications and um, why not to use Archelion for everything and uh, why I'm using Mokito, not Mar uh, Archelion. So we can spend, I think, a whole day discussing this. So actually I spent several days discussing this, but um, it is actually simpler than you may think. So how unit test is defined. And the definition of unit test is testing the smallest possible piece of functionality or, or, or snippet of code. This is actually a unit test. And even if we have a Java E application, we can, it, it, it hopefully consists some business logic. And this business logic has to be tested in isolation. And um, if you would like to test in isolation, you, why to start the application server? So, um, I, I saw even really, no kidding, uh, uh, projects where they started the application server to test getters and setters. This is, I don't get it. This is strange. So um, I would of course never test get and setters. So, um, but um, what I did before, uh, before the show here, I created a very, very simple application and actually created even a GitHub um, project. Um, I will, um, make it a little bit larger. So this is just was the first. You saw, you see, two hours ago, I created the very first commit. Uh, what's called um, workshops, and what the project is is a very simple, uh, a very simple um, boundary control entity application with unneeded package. Oh, but it's just a package. And um, what I did here, I have one control which calculates the uh, the uh, FAT, and I have a unit test which just instantiates directly the class and cal calculates the, um, the, the, the FAT. And uh, I would never start an application server for this. And I would use Mokito if, for instance, the FAT calculator would use the entity manager here 
to fetch the um, you know the tax rates from different countries. So I will mock out the antonym nature because I would would rather test my logic here and not the um, the database. So I will mock out mock out the entity manager with Mokito. But in some applications, um, I use concepts or constructs like, for instance, plugins. And uh, what is the deal with plugins? So usually they rely on CDI, and uh, the plugin has to work in case, uh, or the application has to work with or without plugins. And to test this behavior, you have to use Archelion because you would like to construct um, deployment units with different um, contents. So for instance, I would like to create one war with, without any plugins and see whether default behavior kicks in. Then I would like to create a war with a single plugin and see whether it works and then with multiple plugins. So to create, um, to create a multiple deployment units with different contents is actually only possible or only easily possible with Archelion and um, and uh, uh, particularly in a framework called Shrink Wrap, which is uh, part of Archelion. And I always use um, Archelion for this. But a usual, usual enterprise project does not have such requirements with plugins. So I use barely Archelion in boring enterprise projects. And I, was, I, will, I use always Archelion for a more sophisticated uh, products or projects with higher requirements with um, more sophisticated dependency injection. I hope it is clear. Um, if not, we can write a code next time, but I, I, I will try to, to keep this, um, this edition of Airhex QA a little bit shorter. I hope it is clear right now. Um, if not, I have enough co code and um, I could even record a dedicated screencast about this, but it is basically easy. So, And most of the developers are disappointed that I'm actually uh, uh, write, write um, simple unit tests and, and not an Archelian test to test logic like this. Perfect. So next question. How can you propagate a backend exception, for example, an optimistic log exception to the front end JSF or Java fix? So let's see what actually the origin comment is. Pro propagate. So um, this was the origin exception and uh, this is actually fairly easy. So uh, what I have here is a very simple uh, service, just uh, which um, I can register. Um, um, I can register to a workshop, and um, if everything uh, goes well, I get uh, an, a two hundred one created back HTTP code. And the question is how to deal with exceptions in JAXRS. So what I would usually do in case something bad happens, I would return. For instance, a server error, which is a little bit too generic. So it's much better to use a proper status. And um, the status can be uh, bad requests, for instance, something syntactically incorrect or conflict for optimistic log exemptions, for instance. But the problem is, um, actually, I always look it up in an HTTP uh, um, spec. So what I do is HTTP. RFC code. So status code. And this was conflict. So I will look it up whether it actually fits the ideas um, or, or my error. This will be the first. But the problem is it's also too generic. So you get just, I don't know, what, what is it actually 409 or something like this? Yes. And uh, the client has no idea what actually happened. So what I do then, I use a header. So I write header with X stands for standard extension. I would say here arrow message and I could put message whatever I like. Um, don't be concurrent, <laughs> for instance. And um, then return this response instead of that. 
And um, those, you can always do this. You should do this. So what I sometimes see is like they, um, uh, the project are returning just a response, which is always two, 200. And you have look within the message what actually happened. Um, I think it is a lot easier and, and to use if you get the response code straight away. And, and then you can decide whether you consume the message or not. But yeah, but this is what, what I would suggest. And um, there's a really nice interface in JaxOS, which is um, almost forgotten. And this interface is called Exception Mapper. So what you can do, you can write your own, for instance, runtime mapper. And this runtime mapper implements exception mapper of type runtime exception. So, and what you can do right now is then you can map your runtime exception to the response. So you can say, okay, return response uh, server error. For instance, this, this, is, this is a really a server error, but now I could integrate in a header X message, the message, for instance, uh, exception get message. And I could use here, have to use provider annotation to register this. Uh, and I forgot, of course, build. You can see 80 characters are too short. So um, we had a discussion on my blog. So I could, of course, do this or this. But the question is, why? So we have, I hope, we covered that. Yes. Uh, no, no questions. I will just briefly look at the social stream here. Just open this and close that. Okay. Fine. So we cover this. Next one. Oh, this is um, a more generic one. Uh, someone says, okay, they have um, an, uh, unstructured data in a system in DB2, and uh, it is uh, not uh, is not normalized and unstructured, which is, I would, I would say, real world. And the question is, uh, would I use JPA on such an existing database? In my experience, JPA is an all or nothing technology and isn't easy to introduce in existing systems. So this was an email question. And um, what, I, what, I, what I did once, what I did once, or once, multiple times, what once was, was really convoluted database. It was an old uh, Boland database. I actually forgot the name, but it was crazy. And um, what I did then, you can, for instance, if you have a project, you can go here and say new. Um, Entity classes from database and pick a data database. Uh, hey, he even found the Jabos database, but it couldn't find it, found it, uh, the driver. But I could put the, um, let's see whether I found something else. This one new entity classes from database should be on. Yeah, this is a Glassfish project, so there are different databases installed. You see, it searches for uh, tables. And I could just use, for instance, the account table. And then it will generate the account JPA object for me. But the nice story is, if your database is, looks really bad, it will still work. So sometimes, of course, there, um, all the keys are mapped one to one, but you could write a unit test and at least you know, uh, ping the database with JPA. So I will at least start with JPA, generate the, um, the uh, persistence layer. I usually use NetBeans for this the persistence layer, write some unit test, really unit test, fire up the persistence and entity manager factor in the entity manager in the unit test and see whether it works for you or not. And if it doesn't work, then I would uh, just use JDBC or whatever. But uh, if it does, 
you are actually you have you, you have um, standard persistence. And by the way, all or nothing. I would say in most project uh, I was able to. Or I, I sometimes I work alone, but usually in team, uh, we were able to um, to cover. I would say eighty percent with JPA. And there were always cases where you had to go direct to database using JDBC, or um, or you know connect to um, to uh, functions or stored procedures. So the answer is try with JPA. If it doesn't work, uh, search for something some, some, uh, something else. So in my book, this is the green book. I used parallelizer and multiplier, and uh, someone uh, used this pattern. And the question is. Um, how to write in a single file in Java in environment. And the question is actually broader than my parallelizer and multiplier. So um, first, there is no single file in Java E. If you are in cluster, what, where is the file? Where is it? Is it in Sun? Is it in NFS? Or what is a single file? If you are not in cluster, you are in luckier situation because then you only have to, you only have to deal with possible inconsistencies if m multiple processes are hitting the same file. This is the problem if you have, uh, if you if you if you are in a single node. So um, in a cluster, you have uh, uh, more problems because usually you will have to um, to uh, to access the file uh, remotely. So you will need uh, somehow a running uh, a running system. So um, how to write in a single file? So the question is how to identify the file first. So if the, if there are multiple uh, processes. Uh, what to do with it, and to, they, um, usually you will have to pass the information, like for instance the path to the to the file through the process. How to do this? You could use CDI events, for instance, and uh, just uh, you know uh, put the information to a CDI event and pass it from process to process. You can use uh, futures, which is um, uh, which is um, also nice because um, you can pass the information with the future, you get the handle back and then do something else with it. And uh, you could use completable futures. And I actually will record a screencast about this, I hope next week or um, a week after about just completable futures and uh, to do this. So you can chain different uh, several processes together. So um, I would say the main problem is files are not transactional. And uh, how to synchronize a single file so that the data doesn't get corrupt if you if multiple processes are writing to the file. And um, what what you could do, you can um, write your own connectors, your own uh, JCA connector, and I wrote one which uh, uh, uses um, this is at least transactional, but it is not fully transactional. So if you would like to have a transactional file system, there's something um, also interesting. It's called Jakarta, Jakarta Commons Transactions. And the Jakarta Commons Transaction comes with uh, a file package, which is not back free, but it works uh, surprisingly well. And you get a transactional file. So what you could use, you could use a um, transactional file access, so Jakarta Commons Transactions, with, for instance, connector, wrapped in connector, and you get almost a file store for free. Um, or you could uh, cache the contents of the file with something like, um, for instance, um, Hazelcast. And then if, you're, um, if, you, if you have all the data together, flush it at once and write it, uh, and write it to, to the file system. Or you, could, um, you can set up a very small application server having just um, servlet installed or JAX arrest, and just this process will write to a file and you can connect to the, to the process um, via, uh, via a JAX arrest client and write the file to, um, to, to one process to, you know, to, to mitigate the problems with, with distributed system. Um, What is the I forgot actually what what is actually I forgot what it actually is. I have to admit. What is jock? I will have to find this. Jock. Um, 
Okay. Um, this is uh, the query construction language, and and I would and the question is how to integrate this in in um, in Java Econ appropriately. Okay. Um, how to integrate this is fairly easy because it uh, generates SQL and you will SQL and you will like to to execute the SQL. The only thing you have to to to, to do is to um, to fetch the data source, so to inject the data source uh, with a resource data source to your EJB or CDI bean, and fetch the connection from the data source, pass the connection to an external persistence framework, and um, and then close the uh, connection afterwards. That's the only th thing you have to you have to do. Um, so you have to use a managed JDBC connection if you if you are playing with SQL. And by the way, in um, one of my current projects called Nhydrator. I'm using a plain plain JDBC to access a database and and it uses an unmanaged connections but um if I have several problems to solve right now but at the end of the project or in a few weeks I will introduce a managed uh managed variant of the of the um actually the project uses uses lambda for data transformation so you can fetch the uh, information from JDBC and write it somewhere else I would probably use it for instance to Back on my block, why not? So, but um, I will also I will not rely on JPA. I use the JPA for testing, but um, I will use um, managed JDBC connections. Right now, I use for testing unmanaged JDBC connections because it doesn't matter. So, to integrate such a framework, you only have to to rely on data sources and how it looks like. I will just write some pseudocode. It would look like at resource. And data source, this one, DS, and then just fetch the connection, and then you get the connection. And then afterwards, you have to close the connection. This is nice, because if you close the connection, the connection gets returned to, to the pool. So the connection is actually wrapped. This is not, you know, the uh, Oracle connection. You get something back like pulled connection, and this is application server specific implementation of the connection. Okay. Hope the question is answered. Oh, Davida is happy, and Norisk probably happy. So it's for unknown reasons, it just always forgets about the AHEX. Uh, and XML with full support for map, string, and object. Um, I don't know this, whether you can uh, just with full support for map, string, and object. Huh, I have no idea, but, uh, but regardless, map and objects, uh, this one um, has full support for uh, this response can be consumed as XML and JSON, but this is not a map string and object. In worst case, you will have to write your own mapper, but um, I cannot answer the question right now. But this is actually a good one. Produce map JSON. Oh, but <laughs> okay. Now is the answer. JSON object is a map of string and JSON value. So it is actually already solved in Java 7. String and object, and this is JSON value. If you look at the JSON value, you get um, there are certain types because of JSON, array, object, string, number, uh, boolean, or null. So uh, it is already already solved. The problem is XML. So what to do with XML? This is, uh, this is a broader topic because um, you get key value pairs, so how to deal with XML, but in JSON is already solved. So um, yeah, this is um, in JSON is solved, you know. And who would you, who you would like to use XML? <laughs> and um, sorry, uh, this was just joke. But uh, what you could also do for the XML case, you could you could write your own your your own serializer, and you have to implement two classes: message body reader and message body writer. So you could do this easily. Oh, and Norris is very happy. So you see what we can do.
Okay, so um, where are the questions? We have to go through the, all the questions. This, uh, at least the first 10. This is actually the deal here. So I got a very good question from Adam, <laughs> another Adam. Uh, Adam Dutchak, and that Adam is organizer of uh, of the Geekon con uh, conference, and he asked me a very very interesting question, so um, about uh, constructor injection. And actually, I never used constructor injections in my uh, projects, commercial, and I don't even think in my open source project as well. But it's a valid question. So um, does um, uh, dependency injection work or no, or or not? And it actually always worked. So always means Java 6 and Java E is 7. And in Java 5, no, it didn't because there was no CDI and EJB dependency injection, it didn't work. So it works since Java 6. So what you can perfectly do, let's see here. If I had, let's write some other code. Registrations. So what happened here? Let me just remove the exception. And here, okay, the arrow is gone. So imagine we would like to need here um, another class, which is the country country rate. And this country rate is needed to to you know to go, to get the country specific um, fed. So what I would do, you could use this this would be my code very simple um, to write a unit test um, I will I will mock out this country rate to test this so we had it already the problem is if it would be private I will have to use inject and inject mocks uh, annotations or write getters and setters which I will never do get a setters just for testing so or never sometimes I'm forced to do such a thing but uh, you know um, would try to 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 do something um, more appropriate. So, but what it can also do, you can create a constructor and just put the annotation here. And now this could be private, and the container will inject uh, the uh, the state here. But this is a far more code than this. So um, I would prefer to use this. But you can use dependency injection if you like. But if you put add inject here, everything has to be injectable. So whatever you, you list in the parameters, everything is, get, is getting to be injected. Okay. I hope it's answered. I hope I answered the question. Um, so this is more full of philosoph philosophical one. And I think there is a big difference whether you are in container playing building services or you are in the on the client i think if you are building um, client side applications with more object oriented code um, constructor injection does makes more sense or is more attractive than uh, constructor injection on the application server <laughs> traditional customers um, so you should be lucky that you, you don't have to use soap. <laughs> okay. Um, so, next one. And wait a second. Air hacks? Wow. Oh, now we remember air hacks at least. Oh, Master Pony. I, I'm, 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 I'm lucky and run just one node, but got multiple multi multiple preparing data and write them so I could use a Jakarta commons. You could use Jakarta commons to coordinate the data on disk. So what Jakarta commons will do, it will write to a temporary file and then commit the file will appear. It is it's basically copied from the repository to your folder. So you will see the file in the file system. But um, Jakarta commons is a little bit complex and the um, connectors are complex. So I would first look at Java Nio, probably is a good enough. If not, um, go to Jakarta Commons and but write t some tests, and um, yeah. <laughs> Usually, I shouldn't answer such questions. I will. I would first answer what is actually a use case, and then we could talk about the technology. But um, I think you see where I'm going with this is um, 
is you have always a problem because uh, Fire is basically a singleton and Java is distributed and it's always a problem to, to, you know, to, to, to uh, synchronize singletons in a distributed environment without deadlocks and stuff like this. But thank you for asking or asking for the interaction. Okay, so um, this is also nice. How do you handle uh, two PC with this protocol? And uh, let's see what is uh, how to tackle a protocol adapter. So um, what he refers to, she or he refers to um, uh, protocol adapters is what I uh, what I did. I in in uh, how to tackle Java E. I gave a keynote online. Keynote is recorded. Is online, so you can watch it if you like. And what I did, I created um, entity control boundary application, which is very similar to this. And what I said is. Um, the registration resource is something like a protocol adapter because the protocol adapter exposes the registration EGB as a RESTful web service, and I would have, I could also have here SOAP service, which, which exposes this, uh, the same functionality, which is registration as a SOAP. This is what I said during the, uh, the um, keynote for the Dev Crowd conference. And uh, the question is, um, yeah, uh, how to handle two two uh, two uh, two phase commit or X eight transactions with JAXRS? And I think JBoss had a project; they were able to see, to to send um, transaction IDs, X IDs from two phase commit over the wire. So you you could get a two phase commit via JAXRS. But the problem is, JAXRS has also its weak has its weaknesses. So. Um, if you are thinking about JAX uh, two-phase commit, you have to also should be able to catch XA exceptions. And this is one of the um, my favorite ones. So if there, this is actually the XA exception, which can happen during, uh, during uh, commit or during the interaction with two-phase commit. And if you can see, my, my favorite is because I always click on it, it's heuristic mix. It means one process was committed and the other was rolled back. So the question is how to recover from this. So um, two-phase commit, I would say, is not the right, right approach to coordinate applications on this level. The question is, what is the right approach? And the right approach is, in my eyes, is to use um, fire and forget. So um, fire and forget with compensative transactions. And what compensative transactions are, are not undo transactions, are basic undo transactions, rather than business transactions. So what it means is in uh, Git or Subversion, if something goes wrong, the compensative transaction is merge. It's not, it's not like uncommit, it's just merge. If you order something uh, on Amazon and you don't like it, the compensative transaction is to send it back. So this is compensative transaction, so you will have to think about the business logic and change even the business logic. This is actually the... Um, the uh, the answer. So a little plug here. We actually talked the whole day about this during the um, air hacks and the architecture day, just about transactions and and all the stuff. So we had a really nice discussions. But but um, you have to rethink. It is not like you cannot coordinate multiple distributed processes with a technology. It, it just does not work well enough. And um, usually, what happens back then, if we had um, in the IOP time frame. We use two-phase commit, but uh, what happens in, in several projects, actually, all the XA exceptions were just silently ignored. So all the, def, uh, the, the log statements were redirected to dev null and no one cared about this, so, and the system became inconsistent. So um, with JAXRS, um, you get the same. So it's actually, it's not, the problem is not JAXRS, the problem is a conceptual one. Hope the question is answered. Um. <laughs> Okay, uh, no jokes about soap. They hurt. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, so, where are my questions? So enough marketing. So also another one. I get it um, a lot. Actually, a very, a very smart, a really smart question. I have a got a question about BCE. If I have a message-driven bin, how would it be classified? So the question goes, okay, I have my uh, boundary, which uh, all the, you know, the boundary is the boundary between the UI and the, and the business logic. Control is reusable stuff. 
and the entities are the persistent JP entities. The question is how to deal with message-driven beans. So what are message-driven beans? And if you think about this, what a message-driven bean actually is, a message-driven bean is a... Um, If you think about this, here's, here's our uh, boundary. And uh, the boundary, yeah, and we have different clients. So we have HTML5 client, which talks about, um, over uh, JSON and, I don't know, WebSockets with the boundary. And you think about this, we could also have a queue. And we could map to the queue a message-driven bean. And this message-driven bean could talk to the same service here. So we have a service which is exposed with a message-driven bean or exposed with JAXRS or exposed with SOAP or exposed with IOP. So if you, if you, if you look at this, from, from this perspective, a message-driven bean is just another protocol adapter and I will put this message-driven bean into the boundary package. So we have a package here, boundary, and the entity bean, I would put it to the boundary package. But... If you have integration packages, or you just imagine a host system which interacts with the backend, we can think about putting the message-driven bean to, to a dedicated package called integration. Could be, so for integration purposes. But usually, usually it would be always just, it would be also just another client. So why to deal a legacy host differently? So usually you can say, okay, the host is just a legacy client, but you can use exactly the same channel to, to talk to, with uh, uh, with the application service. And by the way, message-driven bean does not have to be mapped to a JMS queue. Um, in some projects, we use just raw sockets. We wrote, um, we wrote a um, JCA connector, and this JCA connector was um, uh, was mapped to a to a server socket, and the server socket translated the uh, the binary data to uh, to messages, and the message-driven bean was integrated. So we used message-driven beans to receive um, messages generated by uh, by some machines, so some hardware. Okay, I think we covered this. Look, I perfect and air hex. No questions. Very good. And probably the last one, how to lazy load fields and entities for your UI. By the way, what you should do immediately after the show, you should follow all the guys who, um, and uh, actually just guys. So next, one, next time we should, could get uh, some, some uh, women as well. So, um, but you should follow whoever asks a question here, just, just as, as a credit. So this should be done at least. Um, so, um, how to load lazy, uh, lazy load fields and entities for your UI in JSF and FX in Boundary? Um, and the problem is, of course, so if you have the uh, registrations here, so registration is an entity, and this entity could have, uh, for instance, a collection of addresses, and the addresses could be lazy loaded. So, what happens then after the commit? Um, the um, the collection. So first, if you how it works behind the scenes, the collection. So this is the end site. Usually, what most of the frameworks are doing, they are creating a proxy for the collection, and it's only active in case the entity manager is active. But after the commit, the entity manager is no more active, and if the manager is no more active, and you try to get the um, you can do access if you attempt to access the uh, collection, you get. Um, Strange errors. I remember once unresolved proxy errors, something like this. And um, how to deal with it? So there is a, a thing called fetch joins. So you can you can use joins to lazy uh, to eager load lazy fields. Uh, you can of course set it eager, which would be the best for more static use cases. Or um, what you can use, you can use Java seven fetch groups, and fetch groups. It's like you are marking with attributes your path. So you can mark your relations with attributes, and then you can specify a fetch group during the query, and everything which belongs to the fetch group gets eager loaded. And um, this is what I would do. 
And uh, what happens then? Yeah, and then you can um, have a lazy loading everywhere on, on demand, just execute a fetch group or specify a fetch group and everything which belongs to the fetch group is going to be, uh, to be eager loaded. So this, this would be the answer. And okay, the next one is very simple one. So I will just take the um, question number 12 and everything else postpone to, the, to June. And uh, if you have any questions, ask right now. Um, after answering this question, uh, it is one hour. So I, I hope today that we can go through about in half an hour. So um, easy one. What is the best practice to run scheduled event on only one node in a EE cluster? So we had just a jar. We had the schedule event here. And the trick is this. If you specify this, the, this schedule event is going to be stored in, uh, in a database. And if the database is central, um, this event will fire only once, so um, in the whole cluster. And the question is how to know whether it's central or not. In Glassfish case, um, I think, where is it? It is somewhere here. Uh, install databases sublime EGB timer Oracle so and if you can see this is the table where you can specify and the um, table resides in a central database um, the, um, the uh, schedule will run only once in the whole cluster but if you will use um, if you are going to use transient timers, they will fire once, once per node. So that's actually the difference. So let's see. Uh, it's using file channel to write the file by the, the multipliers. It should be, but um, it should be thread safe, but I will look up, I will double check that on Javadoc. Um, so everyone is happy. So I would say thank you for watching and see you. The next event is actually in May. So I will just show you this because I will, I'm invited to a conference in um, Kiev and this is uh, this one and then 23rd of May. And I would like to show you live uh, some tricks I'm using similar to the exception mapper with JAXRS 2.0 and Java 7. So um, I just bundled of the um, most frequent questions and um, answer them, them, them here. And uh, my GitHub account is Adam Bean. And you can see most of the examples here. And yeah, thank you for watching. And um, I would say, see you in upcoming conferences and the, um, and the keynote, the first Monday of the month uh, at 6 p.m. CET. And I will post the, um, these, the recordings to YouTube um, tomorrow. And uh, see you at conferences. And yeah, Hex in Munich um, is um, so far always sold out. So the events will take place. And then you can ask questions and you will get even t-shirts, gifts, and some surprises. And um, in the middle of the workshop, we get a free event. We call uh, we call it Airhex Tribe. So um, we get we get a barrel of beer. Uh, it's called uh, Airhex Broy, and uh, you can ask me whatever you like. So we have you don't even have to register. Just just come and visit us at the Munich Airport. So thank you for watching, and uh, see you next time. Bye.